Hello, I'm Jennifer Keller, the Programming Coordinator at the Westport Library. Today, I'm with two speakers who have been to the library separately and are now teaming up with an historical look at the struggle for bodily autonomy, personal, legal, and medical, that has been central to the feminist activism. This is part of this year's Westport Reads series. Our first speaker, you may remember Kate Manning as the author of My Notorious Life. Hi there. Kate. Glad to be back at the library online. Kate has, has also written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Glamour, Elle, and a few other magazines. She's also a former producer of documentaries for Channel 13 and is also the recipient of two Emmy Awards. Our other speaker, Rhea Hirschman. Hello. Is a writer specializing in health, science, public policy, and legal issues is also an adjunct professor of women's and gender studies at UConn Stanford. She was recognized for her contributions to the feminist movement by the Connecticut chapter of Veteran Feminists of America and even founded a feminist bookstore in New Haven. Little known fact, Rhea was also Kate's high school English teacher. <laughs> we love, we love, both of us love that fact. It's true. And like without everything. further ado, I will hand over the screens to you two. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to start. Uh, we're going to try a, a technological marvel here. I'm going to. We're going to go through a series of historical slides. So let me try now to share my screen while um, we're here. Uh, there we go. Um, I I wanted to say this is this is a great honor. And as a novelist, I come at this history of, of the politization of politicization of um, the women's of, of women's reproductive rights through this one person just one story uh, of, of Anne Trow Lohman who was known as Madame Restel and in the 19th century she was known as the wickedest woman in New York and in digging into her history I uncovered a story that I had never heard before and it came to realize that women today have, we have very little hit, uh, understanding of our own history and how uh, our bodies have been politicized and th throughout centuries. So Anne Lohman was famous and notorious for running advertisements like these in newspapers um, in the middle of the 1800s for uh, medicine. She sold medicines. Uh, with these coded names like uterine regulator, uh, advertised to married ladies, <clears throat> and they were they used euphemisms like not to be used for uh, a regulator of asterisk, and they must not be used when asterisk. And women understood that these ads would cause a miscarriage if they were pregnant, and so Madame and others. She was not the only one. You see, there's. Madame Castello and some others selling Portuguese female pills um, ran these ads, uh, which women understood would, would cause a miscarriage if they did not wish to be pregnant. Um, if, they, if the pills didn't work, and they often did not, uh, Madame Restel would perform an abortion. And you have to remember that in, that in those days, women underwent these procedures without any anesthesia but they were willing to endure such things because the birth rate at that time was something like seven live births per woman. And so these advertisements really were the first information that many American women had that they could control the size of their families. And you have to remember too that childbirth <clears throat> was itself quite dangerous. W women had a very high maternal mortality rate. A lot of the information about these medicines and these natural remedies came from African-American midwives who <clears throat> traditionally um, had a long tradition of helping each other avoid pregnancy. And you can imagine why they would wish to do so given the incidence of rape of ens enslaved women. But they passed a lot of their lore about herbs and natural remedies um, on to white women and were very uh, instrumental in perfecting the arts of midwifery. Sibby Kelly herself, uh, I'm not, I don't know whether she participated in terminating pregnancies, but she certainly delivered more babies than any midwife in Georgia. 
So what was in these medicines, um, a mix of things. Some of them were actually quite dangerous. You can see turpentine and lye, but <clears throat> other things like tansy or ergot, which was a fungus, ergot is a fungus that grows on grain. And women noticed that cows who ate this corrupted grain miscarried their calves. So they learned that if they wanted to uh, stop a pregnancy, they might try eating this corrupted grain. And even today, ergotamine is used to start a, a stalled labor. So Madame sold these pills and she began to be quite well known. And this is how she started to be portrayed in the news media as a hag of misery. You can see that the female abortionist is portrayed as a bat woman, this bat devouring an innocent child. And so the, the, as, as she got more prominent, the male medical profession really noticed, started to take notice and, um, and portrayed her as just a mercenary greedy person who was just doing it for the money. Um, but really, she ran a full service operation. You can see that she, she delivered babies. She gave lessons in breastfeeding and, and taught and wrote pamphlets about birth control and controlling the size of your family. Um, I love the pregnant man there. Yeah, it's a joke. She was uh, the butt of a lot of jokes. Um, and, and you can see her in her little red scarf and, and all the women in their veils and disguises um, are, are all pregnant. But it's, this is because there was a great shame and, and embarrassment and taboo in going to see Madame. And as I said, she, she got quite wealthy. This is her house on Fifth Avenue. She was fair game for the press to criticize her window shades. Um, and as she got rich, she also attracted the attention of uh, religious zealots, such as this man, Anthony Comstock, who was a, a Congregationalist from New Canaan, Connecticut. And he founded the uh, Society for the Suppression of Vice and had himself appointed a US Postal Inspector uh, and was responsible for what is known as the Comstock Laws. The Comstock Laws made it illegal to send anything obscene through the United States mail. And this could even include an, an anatomy textbook. And there were other restrictions on uh, birth control information and certainly on abortion. And he made many arrests, including that of Madame Restel and Lohman. He disguised himself as a man seeking help for his wife and went and arrested her. And at the time he was bragging that he had driven 15 people to suicide. And indeed one of those was Madame Restel. Uh, she'd been practicing a long time and she knew the laws were changing, the tide was turning, the male medical profession was taking over. And she, on the morning of April 1st, uh, climbed into her bathtub and slit her own throat. And this story seemed to me uh, extraordinary. Many people believed that she was so wicked she had faked her suicide and was going to come back and, and tell the stories of all the men whose wives and mistresses and daughters and, and sisters had been using her services for so many years. And I thought, well, that would be quite a story. <laughs> and so I borrowed Madame's life for uh, some of it for this novel uh, about, her, about that era. And, uh, you know, I think Madame was really a precursor to Margaret Sanger, sort of the foremother, who we, we were much more familiar with what Margaret Sanger did. But she also suffered under the Comstock laws. And Rhea, Professor Hirschman, oh, stop. Will, will pick up from here the politics of, uh, and the politically charged history of, of women's bodies. Okay, so uh, there are so many people and there are so many stories and I just want to say that at the outset because mm -hmm. we'll be talking today but just about a couple of a couple of the figures and it's just really important for us to remember that these were not the only people. Uh, these are just a way of framing, using these figures as a way of framing the story in which so many women and male allies were involved. Margaret Sanger was a nurse. She was trained as a nurse. Uh, at visiting nurse, and she saw so much death and misery, uh, women begging her for the secret of how not to have children, that there was a point in her nursing career when she just said that she was going to abandon palliative work, that was her exact quotation, 
and instead decide to change the laws by breaking them. And she, much later in her life, she's quoted on an interview, a uh, television interview, was saying the only way to change the law was to break it. And that's exactly what she did. She went to jail twice. Um, the second time, uh, she was arrested for having opened a primitive clinic, I'm sorry, not a primitive clinic, a clinic that provided um, the best available at the time, which was a primitive version of the diaphragm to immigrant women in Brooklyn. And you can see this flyer printed in all the languages that were spoken by the immigrant population in that part of the city. The appeal of her conviction uh, led to a medical exception that licensed physicians could prescribe uh, contraception to married people for health reasons. And within those constraints, Sanger and her colleagues built a network of independent women's health centers that eventually became Planned Parenthood. This is Sanger's clinic, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> which was, as um, the slide says, closed after 10 days and over 400 patients she's arrested. And this is her famous quotation, uh, no woman can call herself free who does not own and control her body. We're gonna now skip a whole bunch of decades. I think we're skipping decades. Let's see, within, let's see the next slide. <laughs> yes, we're skipping decades, okay. Uh, there was plenty going on during those decades. Again, this is just a really short overview. We come to another lawbreaker. And uh, at this point, Planned Parenthood operated, had been operating for um, 30, or, 30 or 40 years, but birth control was still illegal in Connecticut and several other states that had not undone their own Comstock laws. Birth control pill came on the market in 1960, actually on my birthday, uh, with a lot of help from Margaret Sanger, another part of her story that we won't go into now. And uh, Estelle Griswold over here on the, um, can I guess I'm pointing at the screen, but you can't see Estelle Griswold with, um, on the left. Um, and Cornelia Dickerman Janke, the president of the Board of Planned Parenthood at the time, uh, Estelle Griswold and colleagues opened up a clinic on Orange Street in New Haven for the express purpose, as Margaret Sanger had done, for the express purpose of courting arrest. They were um, accommodated by the New Haven police who came and raided the clinic in, in um, mid-1961. And as the police were examining, running, you know, going around the clinic looking for evidence, uh, uh, Griswold took the occasion to give them a lecture on birth control and offer them a tour of the clinic. The arrest led to the Supreme Court case that we call now Griswold versus Connecticut, which legalized birth control in 1965 for married people, made birth control legal nationwide by overturning Connecticut's and other remaining Comstock laws. A later case, 1972, Eisenstadt versus Baird, less well known, but that Supreme Court case legalized birth control for anyone, not just for married persons. At the same time, all this was happening at the same time, abortion rights activism was burgeoning. We tend to think of religious leaders as being conservative and opposed to abortion. Nothing could be further from the truth. And one example of this is the clergy counseling service, sometimes called the clergy consultation service, that was started by a group of ministers in New York City, one of whom was Howard Moody, but had its equivalent in other parts of the country as well. There was a clergy counseling service in Connecticut and what they did up until Roe versus Wade in 1973 was they ferried women across state lines to New York where abortion had become legal in 1970. Their story again is another amazing story that is worth looking into further. Reproductive rights activism, <clears throat> excuse me, is part of the broader activism related to women's health and women taking their own health into their own hands and control of their own bodies. This is a pre row 1971 abortion rights march. There are many all over the country. This is in Washington, D.C. And a perfect example of women taking their health into their own hands is going to be shown on the next two slides about Jane. The Jane Collective in Chicago was started by undergraduate students, you know, very young women, who saw the need for a way to help their friends who needed pregnancy termination to do so. And they started this referral service called Jane, and they said, well, we're going to use Jane because it's a, it's a, it's a common name. Uh, we want this to just be a common part, of, an everyday part of women's lives. And for a while, they did... <clears throat> They had someone, a man, who performed the procedures safely, illegally, but safely. 
And then at some point they found out that this man was not a doctor. And when they found out this interesting fact, they thought, well, if he can do it, we can do it. And he, they got him to teach them how to do the procedures. And right. So you were having, at that time, you had uh, housewives and, and you know, mothers and students actually performing pregnancy terminations in safe spaces like hotels. Right, exactly. And the women of Jane performed something like, uh, we don't have the exact number, approximately 11,000 illegal safe abortions with no fatalities and only a very small number of uh, hospitalizations. Right. The next slide, um, they were raided. Uh, one of the people who came for supposedly for an abortion was actually a policewoman um, and she outed them and they were arrested in 1973. And one of my favorite stories about Jane is the one I'm going to ask Kate to tell. because she's Well, it's, a, it's, a, these women were very brave, extraordinarily so, as are many of these people we're talking about today. Um, the, in the paddy wagon on their way to the, the jail, um, they had collected all the note cards of the names, that the secret na names that they collected of women and their phone numbers that they were due to contact. And in, they were afraid that the police would then arrest those women too. So they tore off the corners of the note cards with all the phone numbers and ate them. One of my favorite, one of my favorite stories about taking our, taking our fates and our lives and our health into our own hands. Meanwhile, again, all this is going on at the same time in the, um, 1969. So go back a couple of years to 1969, um, a group of women met during a female liberation conference in Boston and their experience at a women's health workshop led them to form what became the Boston Women's Health Collective in 1970, they published this newspaper, no, I'm sorry, newsprint pamphlet, which then became the very well-known book, Our Bodies, Ourselves, starting in 1971. This book has been published in 29 languages. It sold over 4 million copies worldwide, named in 2012, one of the 88 books that shaped America, uh, now online only because of the proliferation of health information on the internet, but an absolutely essential Bible to generations and generations of, of women. Also at the same time, in 19, this is in 1971, in 1971, women's health activists, Belita Cowan and Carol Downer, figured out how to use a plastic speculum, a flashlight, and a mirror to examine their own cervixes. And then they gave a public demonstration. This is not that demonstration, but it's an equivalent. A public demonstration at a feminist bookstore in Los Angeles of how women could examine themselves. Soon the idea that women could be more than passive recipients of medical knowledge was taken up by activists and everyday women around the country. The women's health movement continues. Uh, this is one organization, the Women's Health Action Movement, but we have numerous national and regional and state players. I'm just gonna name a few of them. The National Women's Health Network, the National Advocates for Pregnant Women, the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse, the National Black Women's Health Imperative, Sister Song, with their emphasis on reproductive justice, which we'll talk about um, in, a little, in a few minutes, uh, NARAL Pro-Choice America, the list goes on. All of these organizations spawned from this activism uh, that took root in the 60s and 70s. By 1973, there were more than 1,200 identified women's self-help groups around the country and also a network uh, by the mid to late 70s, a network of over 50 feminist health centers, independent health centers dedicated to women's health and not just women's reproductive rights, but women's health in general. Most of them are gone now, again, for a lot of reasons that maybe we'll be able to get into when we, when we chat after the slideshow. Uh, in many ways, but not all, the women's health movements permanently change women's relationship to their bodies and the provision of health care in America. And I want to make sure to mention the central role of women of color in this movement and the shift of emphasis from reproductive rights, which, which we think of more in legal terms to reproductive justice, the idea of which is to create a society and create a healthcare system that allow women to choose when and where to, when to have children, how many children to have, to have safe pregnancies and to raise their children in health and safety. And I think that that whole idea is encapsulated by this slogan, trust women. We still have a long way to go. You'll see some statistics up there at the top of the page. And um, we'll so, talk more about those. So let's, let's wind up the slideshow and, um, and go on from there.
So Kate, what are you thinking? I'm thinking that, you know, through the ages, the last 200 years of women's reproductive health, there certainly has been a lot of progress, as you mentioned, but the lack of information that we have as about our own bodies and about our own history is, remains a problem. And you see that that information is really the key and that um, these advertisements in the 1800s, that Margaret Sanger's advertisements, that these marches, finally this public outpouring of, of uh, demands of, 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 for, for our rights has made all the difference. Without the information, the shame and the stigma about our own our own anatomy and our own reproductive systems has remained and and it's it's still there so that even when i began my own look at this i i, I said pregnancy termination when i talked to book clubs i couldn't say the word abortion because it was offensive and people still had a you know a, a an attitude about it that it was something shameful and that you didn't talk about it and women would come forward and tell the stories about what their lives had been like before it was legal and um we're old enough to remember some of that yeah so a um, couple of thoughts about what what you just said a statistic that we did not put up there that we easily could have is that if we're talking specifically about abortion that uh, approximately 40 percent of women will have a pregnancy termination at some point in mm -hmm. their reproductive lives. So it is a very common procedure. And uh, I looked for a photo and could not find one of some of the early abortion speak outs where women literally got up in public. Uh, and the, um, I remember them on the New Haven Green in the in right before Roe versus Wade, but there were many others. Women literally got up in public and told the stories of their illegal abortions as a way of um, not just communicating information, but but to busting for busting the stigma. And there are many right. projects now uh, which which ask people to tell their stories as a way of letting people know this is a common experience. Much like the um, fight for uh, LGBTQ rights. You know, once people understand that this is something that happens to their neighbors and their family members and people that they love, and this is a choice and not a choice, it's it, in, in, in terms of reproductive rights, it is a choice. But, um, you know, the more information, the more we understand and shine light on um, what goes on in people's lives, the, and, and then the, the more, uh, freedom we will have. And, and yeah, I want to make two comments about that. So one is a topic from a longer conversation, although I have a theory about it. We have made much greater progress, sustained progress. There's still a long ways to go, but we've made much greater sustained progress on LGBT rights than we have on women's reproductive rights on which we are moving, uh, the ladder on which we are moving backwards continuously. And my theory about that, again, it's a longer conversation. My theory about that is that LGBT rights do not essentially undermine patriarchy. And women's right. control of their bodies essentially undermines patriarchy. Well, that's a longer conversation for sure. But as far as patriarchy goes, you can really see that it is not just abortion that, that, that is under assault. It is also birth control. Right. And that much of this actually comes from a very old patriarchal religious tradition. And it is not all religions because certainly all religions that are uh, that we have in this country do not uh, have the same attitude toward uh, birth control and, and abortion as a very fundamentalist and conservative religions do. So that's another long conversation. Is this an right. imposition of one kind of, of belief on, on a secular group or wow. another kind of religious faith? So I think that um, really on this 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, which we're celebrating here, it's extremely important that not just women vote, but that we all go out and vote for, you know, this this to make progress and we certainly will not make progress without this kind of outpouring that we've seen and the bravery of women that we've seen in this brief look at uh our history the the, the daring of women like madame rastel who performed abortions and risked arrest and 
um, and women who marched and women who ate note cards <laughs> in a paddy wagon. And, and women who and, shouted there, who spoke in, on the New Haven Green, you know, there right. are women who were doing, uh, doing that, who had literally never told anybody that story before. And they got up on the New Haven Green and told the, anybody who was passing by. Yes. It's so so, it, so um, it's voting, it, voting is, we see that a hundred years has made some difference, but many people stayed home have stayed home in the last few elections and we need to get out there and Don't get me started and, and it's it's the it's the that is the body politic the well, body is uh, politicized <laughs> i w i want to say do we have another few minutes because i want to say something else about the women's health movement we can have a couple minutes yep okay so just just back for a moment to this larger idea of the women's health movement of um women taking control of their bodies, taking control of their medical care, getting knowledge, accurate knowledge about their bodies, not being ashamed of their bodies. Uh, the, there's a whole other conversation, which again, we're not gonna have a um, chance to have now, but I just wanna, I wanna emphasize um, how important it was not to not just, not, not just not to be ashamed of using birth control or not, not to be ashamed of, having had an, an abortion, but the, the historical construction of the woman's body as something of which women are supposed to be ashamed. Well, the whole, and the historical construction of women's body as a vessel only, right. and, the, and valuing um, it as an instrument for men or for the housing of, a, of an infant, for the, right. the, the propagation of the species you know so that the woman's body is not her own it belongs somehow to the public sphere and and i think that as you're saying uh it's it's this very idea has caused so much of the shame and the stigma but it is also necessary to change the language so for example if you have uh, an anti-choice or anti-abortion bill it really is a forced pregnancy bill you, if you just shift the lexicon you see that it, you're not just saying oh i'm against abortion or i'm pro pro life you're saying we want to force you to be pregnant so you, it's it's a question of relearning how to think about ourselves as you say Ria. right right um there there is much more but um uh, shall we stop here well, I think, I think that makes a good place to stop. Um, that's a lot for everybody to think about right now. And I'd like to, I'd, so much more. I'd so like much to more. thank you, Rhea and Kate, for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, for those of you at home watching this, more videos, educational and author talks, um, and information about the Westport Library, remember to visit westportlibrary.org.